Good morning and thanks for joining me for today's FS Club webinar, Strategy in Action, How to Own, Develop and Execute Your Strategy with Dr. Ankil Gaviero, Founder and Managing Partner of AJ Strategy and Partners, a London-based strategy consultancy and advisory service for the financial services industry with a special focus on digital and climate finance. Dr. Gaviero has more than 25 years of senior executive experience as a banker and strategist in corporate and investment banking and retail and commercial banking. He's worked in the UK, UAE and Spain covering North America, EMEA and Asia Pacific, including for Wells Fargo, Lloyd's Wholesale Banking and Markets and Corporate Banking Divisions and Barclays International Retail and Commercial Banking Division. He has an MBA from Duke University and a PhD in Financial Economy from the University of Madrid and is a Fulbright Scholar. I've certainly been part of many workplaces who have spent a small fortune on strategy consultants, had a few rallying sessions with staff, pinned a colourful chart to the wall and then within a month, however well intentioned, the strategy is buried under more pressing concerns. So I'm very intrigued to hear how we can master ownership and execution of authentic strategies this morning. Uh, but before I hand over to Dr Gaviero for a deep dive into strategy, uh, the usual brief housekeeping points from me. So if we haven't met yet, uh, virtually or in person, I'm Charlotte Dobrashley and I manage the FS Club here at ZN. I'd like to warmly acknowledge and thank our very generous sponsors who enable us to continue to bring you a wide range of thought-provoking webinars across finance, technology and economics and strategy today. As usual, uh, the slides are publicly available on the website and in the chat box. We'll record the session and it will be available to watch on our website within 48 hours. And the Q&A session will be held after Ankal's presentation so do submit your questions um, early into the GoToWebinar chat facility and then I can feed them into the conversation. And also we'll have a few polls this morning, so make sure you're paying attention so you can contrib contribute. Um, now it's my pleasure to hand over to you, Ankal. Well, thank you very much, um, Charlotte, for your kind words uh, of introduction. And uh, thank you everyone in the audience for uh, attending this webinar. I'm, I'm really pleased to be here with you and be able to share uh, this book that actually is, is not really my, my merit as the merit of a lot of colleagues that work together during the years in strategy teams inside and outside the banks, right? All right, so let's go to it. Um, and in that regard, let me start uh, with, with the why and then the what and the how. So I, I really, uh, this uh, particular sentence by Tony Morrison uh, resonated with me when, when I, uh, I saw it. And uh, definitely I started in 2014 to put together actually what became the chapter 11 of this book. And then step by step, the frameworks and, and the different chapters came along in the, in the recent years. Uh, but uh, with the book really, uh, the reason why I, I wrote it is twofold. On the one hand side, it brings obviously the experience from uh, this uh, near 20 years in and out in the strategy function as I combine with my banking uh, career uh, but particularly from the three banks that Charlotte mentioned across retail commercial corporate investment banking asset management and uh, and in that regard, uh, the ultimate reason is that I think that there is a great opportunity for uh, managers, uh, line managers from business unit all the way to the group in the organizations to really level and develop better strategy. And as a consequence, to get a competitive edge out there, there is a room for framework to do it better. And, and this is a, a humble uh, started for them to get into that uh, road, right? Now, what the book is gonna uh, present you is a, a holistic management strategy framework uh, to navigate both businesses that could be a small startups, business units, all the way to divisions and groups in multinational organizations. Now, you may uh, expect a lot of disquisition and, and discussion about what is a strategy. And I really have to recognize that being very cheeky because I just put uh, forward the Oxford English Dictionary, which I believe, as far as me is concerned, works very well because what really matters is which are the elements of a strategy to make good quality strategy and how to go about developing them as a plan, as a process, and as a skill. And this is what the whole book is about. It's about the how. And uh, in that regard, I thought that probably could be this a good point to make uh, uh, share a poll uh, with all of you to get uh, gather your impressions of what has been your experience with the strategy. So that helps us to introduce the, the framework. 
So back to you, Charlotte, in that regard. So first question, if you have ever participated in a strategy development exercise, what did you think of the average quality of the experience? Very good, good, average, poor, or very poor? We'll just um, leave that open for a few uh, moments longer to encourage everyone to submit their answer. I'm not quite sure what the majority will be here, but I certainly know my experiences. Okay. Oh, not too bad. So we've got um, average 33%, equally tied with good at another 33%, and very good and poor at 17%, and no one's experience was very poor. So that's quite promising. Absolutely. And in that regard, I am I'm not surprised uh, to be a little bit of uh, variety across the answers because there is a trick in that question, the word quality. Because in order to judge and to have a perception of quality, we need to have a benchmark, a framework against which uh, we can compare. If you are or you are familiar with the finance function or with the risk function in a bank, you have a very strong framework that have developed in point time and everybody is very familiar with them so that you can compare. But I bet that for the strategy, maybe there is not that clarity. And I hope that this uh, framework can help out to go in that direction. So that brings me to continuing and introducing you to the holistic management strategy framework. So this pyramid, uh, basically across business unit division and group, uh, if we, uh, the book is divided in four, five parts and the first fourth tackle the HMS. So if you look at the bottom part uh, of this, bottom half part of the pyramid on the left hand side, the left slope is called existing geography and businesses and the first three frameworks, business model, strategy, blueprint and financial plan. That is the content of part one. Part two looks at the right hand side of the slope, uh, the framework of attractiveness versus opportunities in organic growth process is still in business unit and as well the number six, a little bit upper strategy and execution framework. That's part of part two. When we move to part three, then we begin to go up to division and group, and then we look at portfolio strategy, growth from the portfolio value gap and the portfolio horizons frameworks. And then at the very summit, then we look at uh, the leaders, leadership and management excellence and the CEO board company excellence. The part fifth is dedicated to future of strategy, the strategy function itself, and uh, the last chapter about digital strategy in the context of the financial services industry. The framework uh, obviously is based on all the uh, anecdotes and uh, cases used within the book are based on financial services industry, but aspires to have a generalist application to other industries, obviously, uh, for what is worth. And then uh, just to finish this part, just to mention that to make it a little bit more uh, light the book, I tried to um, risk myself of writing some narrative in the uh, beginning of each of the different parts of the book and actually making a maritime metaphor. So you can, uh, the, the, the story starts in the Napoleonic Wars and you get an officer uh, that becomes suddenly a, a captain in the middle of a tempest of his ship. So part one is about how you navigate your ship and get control of it. Um, then that officer well, continues uh, his career and goes to aboard or take over other ships. So then we are talking about part two and we talk about the implementation about all hands on deck uh, as you see in the picture below. Then the officer continues his career, moves to Commodore, lately to Admiral and then we are talking about a, a, sorry because it's getting a little bit funny, this one. Yes, moving towards what would be a, a strategy of uh, what would be a fleet or what would be a flotilla uh, moving forward, right? And then finally, uh, part four is about the officers, as you could expect, and part three about both the evolution of the technique and art of uh, uh, navigation and about how you can uh, transition from what would be the age of sell to the age of esteem. Right, so from traditional to digital financial services. So moving now to the content, business uh, unit level, part one, existing strategy and geography and business. So the key word here, I'm gonna be talking about malaises in the world of strategy is that business unit is quite often neglected in the strategy development exercises, which focus a lot on division and group. I believe it's a mistake that we need to correct because as you think about it, a big, 
organization with five divisions and 40, 50 business units, it's only the business unit that is in contact with the marketplace, the clients and the competitors. So we need to reinforce and put a lot of thinking about how we win the marketplace at that level too. And there are other disconnections or, or deficiencies, like for instance, the financial plan and the strategy many times is not linked together and they speak each other, numbers and words, and the functions so very often, risk, IT, operations, HR, are forgotten in the process of a strategy and are critical. They can represent 7 to 80 percent of the cost base of a business unit. So to tackle all of those, I propose uh, the HMS US three frameworks. First, the business model. This is about making a snapshot of the business model of the business unit as it is right now, and then obviously evolving it to what it should be in a three or five year, whatever is your strategy horizon. The strategy blueprint, which connects the two snapshots all the way from the purpose of the organization, purpose of the business unit, all the way to the actions. And in the middle, taking critical participation decisions on client, product, and geography. And finally, the financial plan, there needs to be the counterpoint, eh, the counter side of a coin of the strategy blueprint, uh, critically linked by KPIs. So let's use the next page uh, to get a better visual uh, of, of what I'm meaning here. When we talk about the business model framework, it starts into obviously a big understanding and research of the market dynamics, clients and competitors of that marketplace, being that mortgages, SMEs, or fixed income in, in corporate investment banking. And within that marketplace, that bank participates with a particular business model, which is characterized by who we serve, the client segments that we do, versus who are the ones that we don't. The value proposition definition of the what we bring to that who, and the value proposition delivery, the how we bring the what to the who. Those elements of front, middle, and back, and all the process and coordination between them. All of that results in a financial impact, obviously linked to financial plan. With the pictures at this, and Believe me, many times we don't have a very clear picture of how our business model works, particularly on the third element, the value provision delivery. Then we can begin to think and strategize where it should be over the years. Let me bring you an example. I remember in a particular bank, we were thinking a retail bank that was a very good strategy case for a business uh, processing outsourcing to India with a very big economics case, uh, great cost savings. But down there, after approving the strategy, going to the implementation, many of the teams had very, very difficult times in order to get out of the spaghetti, the end-to-end -end mapping of the process. From beginning to end, that you need to lift off, then bring it to destination and re-engineer in situ. So that actually made a big problem, canceled a lot of the project, and the mistake was in the first place made in the strategy phase for not having that very good understanding of what was the status of the processes that were supposed to be lifted. So um, that's a, an example of how difficult value proposition delivery definition of your business model is. Moving down to the strategy blueprint. So that connects the two snapshots. In financial terms, it's like the snapshots are the balance sheet and the PL is the strategy blueprint. So the strategy blueprint starts with the purpose, definition of mission, vision, values, and goals long term, not more than 10, please, KPIs, coming not only from group at business unit level. Then brings to diagnosis, connecting with the market dynamics research that we have done. We need to do our internal diagnosis too in relationship to understand where our strengths and weaknesses. We can use uh, standard frameworks like those mentioned there, or they could be as well ad hoc ones, uh, issue trees, etc. All of that needs to coalesce to a SWOT. Strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, which obviously there is better or worse practice to arrive to it. But important things, then we need to pick up our battles, which ones we're going to attack in the next strategy period. We cannot do them all. Then we move to core strategy. So this is the key participation choices regarding client, product, and geography, where we are going to be and we're not going to be in the next three years. And then from the other stems, the current action that has packets of strategic priorities that help us to remind ourselves continually what we are delivering towards because the delivery happens with the action plans, projects and programs from six months, 12, 24 months and plus that deliver against strategic priorities. Obviously a critical element is the core strategy. And let's another example that happened in the global financial crisis. You go to corporate investment banks, they had a very difficult time to take participation choices, deciding where they wanted to exit. Some of them had the, the, the brave, uh, bravery of doing it, like for instance, UBS, which exited a lot of the fixed income and that helped out to recover much quicker than others. Others didn't, like Credit Suisse, and well, we have seen the aftermath uh, recently. So uh, 
core strategy is fundamental, needless to say, and participation choices and difficult decisions they are critical. And finally, financial plan, which is the counterpart. And here, just to mention that we did KPIs that puts both together. Some that we use very often in my teams was a revenue per product line per client for client segments and then product penetrations of each of the product lines per uh, client segments. That help us to explain all the existing client base in terms of revenues, which we can project them with those KPIs. And then the third one is new to bank clients only with those two KPIs adjusted and parameterized for the uh, clients that come uh, from zero. With that, you can make all the revenue lines that you can translate in activity KPIs that help you to do the cost lines. But then the conversation at business unit level, even at RM portfolio level, is much more real because it's all around the clients and people can understand what they can be done or not in realistic terms. So with that, we are commanding your ship. So let's move on then to the second part. Now we are going to go to uh, on board of the ship's takeovers because we want to, uh, I'm sorry, I need to go down. So I'm doing this with the mouse and that's why I'm having these problems because the keyboard is not connected. Sorry about that. So moving then to taking over another ship. Internationalization, the key malaise there is that we overestimate our strengths and we underestimate the local players. And one of the key elements as well down there in the list of problems that happens is overpaying. Between 60 to 90% of acquisitions overpay and don't and destroy value, according to academic research. And there is a lot of problems about decision-making biases, noises that lead to that. So to tackle that, the attractiveness and opportunities framework in the first place, as you can imagine, you want to go to another market or to another region and compare markets. You start with a macro view of the environment, then you go to industry and then to the opportunities of entry, organic, inorganic, alliances, acquisitions. Critical not to forget to bring your company, what I call legacy. What are you bringing to the market that makes you distinctive, that allows you to compete? So that, in combination with the targets, allows you to see the best way to enter. From there, it comes as an outcome, the entry and expansion cases that you're going to bring then to the second framework, the inorganic growth process, when we're talking about the manes or alliances. Obviously, this is a stage process or, or four stages of going through from the deal origination to the evaluation, due diligence, and deal negotiation. And they give you discipline on doing that, particularly if the bank is not used to a programmatic m &A. Now, the one core element within those is the synergies that span between the valuation and the due diligence. Because synergies, revenue and cost synergies, is what is going to allow you to justify the gap towards what we'll be putting a bid price to win in that contest. The better that they are formed, the synergies were more granted, the lower is the gap, and you help out more the decision makers to make a winning bid without overpaying. So that's how critical. I remember in an expansion on the GCC, uh, I, we decided that from London, we could not do the proper research uh, uh, for that market. So we send the teams two, three months there, um, locating proper small research companies that really have access to the data pools that we may need in order to contrast what we were doing in terms of build up the business case with the synergies. Moving them forward. Now to still in part two to talk about execution. So the problem, the malaise there, and you all probably have seen it many times, is that it's everything but the smooth. The question is how do we go to make it more consistent? And there are two frameworks. One about mobilization of the people, the other about transformation of the hard elements of the organization. On the first one, credit to Liz Mellon and Simon Carter in the book, Strategy of Execution, because their framework I thought that was very useful, right, in our practice. In order to tackle many failures that you see when that happens, people don't buy in, the strategy is coming down because they have not been included on it. Negative politics, people departing, all type of problems that you day in and day out see when we're trying to implement the strategy. On the right hand side, and this credit to Professor Chip Heath and Greg Fisher with the General Management Framework itself based on the seven years of McKinsey, and with content that comes out to the best practices of McKinsey and & Company and my own teams to this uh, realm, where actually you need to plan tackling many of the different constituent elements that help us you know, to go over the fence. For instance, talent. 
seen in organic moves or acquisitions, I've seen banks where actually one of the problems is they didn't have built up the managerial pipeline with people with local knowledge of the markets that you can ship into the targets. So, yeah, so one, can, one deal cancelled as a consequence of feeling very shallow in terms of managerial capability. Um, all the times is talent from the viewpoint of the people you need to send to the integration teams. So the business, how do you convince a business unit or a function head to let the best people to go two years to an integration? You need to have a coverage plan for gaps on that organization and incentivization to the individuals. And then for the talent itself, they go over there, they need to know what is happening with their career after these two years of uh, integration. So sometimes otherwise it's going to be a, a risk averse situation for them to move in that direction. So you need to make kudos for the careers out of it. So all of that needs to plan, needs to be programmed. So at the end of the day, execution, all hands on deck, requires a little bit of planning too. Moving then now up to the division and group level, and we look at the portfolio strategy. So the malaises there is heterogeneity in the sense that you may be in an exercise of a strategy, you have five divisions, everyone doing their strategy on their own without not much commonalities in the methodologies that we are using. So obviously we want to organic with product geography and geographic uh, um, client decisions. And finally, business restructure and disposals, which actually is normally overlooked. The normal pruning you expect in a portfolio, and we are always making the mistake of waiting until we have underperformance to tackle that. I always ask for divestment cases when there are as well investment cases coming out of the plans, right? The fourth part, financial structure, belongs to the CFO and treasury function in terms of optimization of the equity and debt structure and tax considerations for creating value towards the, the gap that we mentioned. So the question is, this can be linked, right? to uh, the portfolio horizons uh, of a division. So you have an example there about three horizons where some of the managerial actions uh, cut across all the business units, so a divisional level, like customer relation management there or the liabilities growth, and all this idiosyncratic of the business unit. The key thing here is that you can have charts like this with the financials by the side, you know, plotting revenues, plotting costs, plotting uh, profits, and then see the narrative of the management actions correlates or not with the financials. So for instance, in business unit one, you would expect the first two years there is decisions about integration and uh, simplification, which then move on to uh, investment growth in years three and onwards. So what you would expect to see, for instance, you plug the cost curve is obviously a going spike of cost in the integration because you have a lot, a lot of one-offs on those uh, and as well probably in the simplification because you are investing to simplify but thereafter you expect you know that it converges to uh, the cost is you expected after the integration and after the simplification years three onwards. When you move to revenues, maybe you be, uh, as well expecting to see a 10, 15 percent is normal a dr drop of revenues during integration, but then precisely in this case because you are reinvesting for growth, expecting you know year on year growth afterwards. So often happens that you know the numbers don't speak the story of the managerial actions, and then we know to go back to the business unit and re revisit the framework that we mentioned before, make sure that line. Once you have that, you can have the discussion at divisional level, see what gaps towards the targets that we may have a division to bring challenges back to the business units to comply uh, and, and bring the, uh, obviously, covering the gaps. The other uh, consideration is the resource allocation. That is, with these uh, inputs, we can then have a discussion about the business cases and the investment cases that they could come from the business units and see how we can prioritize them uh, all together uh, in order to decide which ones go forward for this period of strategy. The book obviously gets a little bit hints on how to do that. Moving now to um, the next level in part four, which is still we are a group division, but we're talking now about the leaders, right? The officers. And 50% uh, of uh, the battle of the marketplace, in my view, gets won or not by the quality of leadership. And this, the, unfortunately, the malaise is a bit the word mediocrity. And understand me well. Every or most of the nature and human uh, behaviors can be explained using a normal or Gaussian curve to it. So when we are talking about that, then you have a average and one standard deviation around. That's what you have, the medi mediocre, the average. The question is how you can move beyond the one standard deviation in the upward slope of that tail going towards the second uh, standard deviation and then to have top quality of leadership and management. And in my view, the culprits obviously come from 
part of the heterogeneity and part of the quality of decision making that gets tainted by biases, noises, and politics. So in that regard, two frameworks get selected here. The leadership and management excellence, which brings uh, the framework called CICOSIP by the acronym of the eight competencies that I claim that we could be investing in a program of 18 to 24 months across all the line management and all levels and new line managers in the future so that we can homogenize certain parts of the, of the, the certain dimensions of the characteristic of a leader that there is no reason why we should not be strengthening. While at the same time, enforcing the diversity and the idiot secrecy of everyone, you know, as leaders they into organization. One thing does not preclude the other. It's an and, not an or. In company excellence, now we are talking about the CEO and the boards behind. And uh, basically here I see the need of a dual framework. On the one hand side, beyond the three to five year strategy, the CEO should be looking how we bring this organization to company excellence upon a long term, uh, 10 year, 15 year horizon. And the board behind, is there going to be two CEOs during that period? Um, and, and here, the best the framework that I brought is um, the the one distilled from the Build to Last by uh, uh, Jerry Porras and, and Jim Collins, 1994, uh, with several elements over there, like the clock making, like the uh, power of the and, etc. And what I applied is to two banks uh, post 2008 during 10, 10 years in a comparison by analyzing the letter to shareholders and their uh, financial statements. The second framework, which in my view needs to counterpoint that, is a framework that focuses on the day to day. And that's what I call the considered decision making framework. And this focuses on the decision making in the key bodies, ex cos and op cos, across the organization. As Jamie Diamond put in one of these uh, letters uh, um, to the shareholders, the profits or the results of this year is the result of the cumulative decisions we had taken at different moments of time across the last 10 years. So that's why this matters. So in the next page, uh, CICOSIP, just to mention, these are the eight dimensions that I was referring to. It is uh, based on a selection of one book, for instance, Think Fast and Slow by Professor Cunningham in Thinking, the value book by McKinsey in value at the very bottom, and is applied across the experience I've seen organizations. But moving to the right, I wanted just to reflect a bit about the considered decision-making framework with this uh, funny chat chart that occurs to me that basically in an ESCO and UPCO you have a decision body that's like throwing arrows you know early to a target but upon time could take six uh, months could take 24 months or years to arrive to that uh, target but definitely has to go through three obstacles the first one is what I call the devil's triangle right of biases and noises as per both books of Cunningham and politics as per Pfeffer that taint a lot of decision making when it happens then uh, there is that molasses of execution maybe it should have been a thicker uh, rectangle than that one but anyway we discuss it in the strategy to execution framework and finally the rise to the marketplace where clients and competitors react so hence this convex lens and as well as stakeholders like could be regulators so not surprisingly many of the arrows don't touch the target the question is how we can bring more arrows into the target and when we're talking about decision making and here is where this framework what trying to bring is discipline of how we define the decision how we classify the taxonomy, how we go about the governance, and finally, the process, the content process. And, and this is the part where I bring more, um, say, innovation, eh, because I suggest ideas like bringing of the psychologists or getting a chair with psychology preparation in order to be able to tackle a lot of devices, noises that happens in the conversation, all the way to use um, tools like Swarm AI, which actually helps a lot for some type of decisions and to help the people visual as well drive to the to the voting and to the decisions. So in my view, uh, disciplines that can create a lot of value. Then uh, with that, we finish the four parts that brings the 10 chapters and then the 10 frameworks of the HMS. And then, um, obviously, I'm going to leave part five uh, so that we can have some Q&A questions um, for you to review. I have a couple of pages there uh, about the future of strategy and suggest some ideas regarding how best can be put in value within organizations. And digital strategy that covers a lot the history of uh, fintech, digital transformation, uh, but focuses on the seven meta-architectural levels that I claim need to be redial for many of the digital transformations that happen to succeed. So just to finish, I wanted just to give a, a final message, which is I believe that the strategy development can become 
in itself a source of competitive advantage for organizations. There's a lot of room to do in that. Only if we take you know, a holistic uh, approach to it across the organization. So this is up to business leaders, so ultimately the CEOs, but everyone can go in that direction and trying to bring current and robust strategy to your workplace. So happy to go back to you, Chan, address any questions as the audience may have. Thanks very much, Ankel. That was really interesting. Um, I particularly liked the ship analogy. And I think what you said about short-term um, CEOs is a big factor on the success as well. So sort of, you know, spending their whole term developing the strategy and then barely time for implementation and then someone else has come in with fresh ideas and there's um, no time, which is very frustrating um, for everyone else. Um, so a question here from Dan Feeney, and he's mentioned the um, famous and relatable Peter Drucker quote, uh, culture each strategy for breakfast. So um, due to that, shouldn't we focus more on cross-cultural communications and team dynamics over traditional numerical at KPIs in a digital first world? Well, um, and this is the, um, the framework of um, Bill to Last says the uh, power of the ant instead of the or. So I you put an ant here, by all means. And this is by Peter Drucker's uh, culture, it's a strategy for breakfast. And uh, I couldn't agree more. I have seen it happening a lot of times. And this actually is precisely what part for is about is the leadership and the management and how precisely uh, people are equipped to being able to understand culture and, and to, uh, as uh, I think mainly Carnegie in ANZ suggested, that it can be engineered, can be purposely moved over the open time and with uh, interventions, right? But obviously the leaders have a lot to say on that, the tone of the top is critical and without that, uh, any strategy is going to definitely uh, failed. Uh, but at the same time, as we mentioned in that part four, it's important to equip leaders because hey, somebody becomes a leader of a business unit or later on of a division and so on. And, and many organizations don't, don't equip the leaders with all the different capabilities that can help them, you know, to how I change that culture, how I influence, you know, my environment, how I communicate more effectively. And, uh, and that requires, you know, purpose action. It doesn't happen by serendipity only. Do you have any recommendations for leaders? I mean, I guess, is it really possible for leaders to know what the culture is like when they're not in the room? Do you have any recommendations for leaders to understand what the culture is like when they're not around in order to influence it? Uh, that's a very good question. And I'm sure that there are very good uh, studies and uh, attempts. Uh, I know that by in the last four or five years, I've seen a lot of focus on that aspect by some of the major strategic consultancies in their publications, right? Uh, so abso absolutely, there are some uh, frameworks that they have been published by some of them that actually could be very helpful in order to map it, right? But that's as usual, framework is a structure. What matters is the content that you bring up on there. And, and the question is about how you capture that content, right? I my view, I'm, I'm, I'm surely many people in the audience have a lot of experience on, on that regard of understanding um, and getting out. I mean, when you are a CEO, particularly when you are a leader, uh, you are a little bit alone in the room. So you need to get out of that comfort zone and really reach out. And there are different ways to reach out, you know, from moving around the corridors and observing and asking questions to obviously going to a small committee conversations with your data reports or directly with the, and that's very important, right, with, with the different uh, team members to get information. Then there are the surveys, as you know, of the employee, uh, the employment surveys. I believe that should be complemented as well with uh, other type of ad hoc uh, um, it could be like, um, it's called SWOT conversations where actually uh, you want a few of people cross-sectional between business and, um, and functions to elicit, right, what they think about uh, what is behind, you know, problems maybe that could be uh, identified. I remember in financial institutions, in one particular uh, bank, we had an employee engagement survey that talked very poorly about what was happening. So what I suggested and actually end up colliding is precisely a type of, uh, that type of SWOT uh, a team where we had representatives of each of the different uh, elements of the business unit so that they could go nitty gritty of what were the, the, the problems or the issues that could be behind all the chapters of the survey and then we 
um, did the problem solving or could be solutions, we probably syndicated across and upon a year time, we changed quite dramatically what people felt about the business unit, right? But everything stemmed from the people. So uh, at the end of the day, that, that radar is fundamental. Mm -hmm. And obviously, it's a very comprehensive model. So, what would you, for say a sort of medium-sized organisation, what sort of time frame would you recommend from development through to execution? Well, if uh, we are, I mean, your question is about getting the whole HMS out there in fruition, yeah. which I never seen. Um, as a matter of fact, only up to the first uh, eight chapters definitely come from things that I've done. Uh, the last two, uh, except for the considered decision making framework that I tried with a couple of small banks recently, uh, I haven't seen, you know, that program of Thicosip going and so on and so forth. But my point is, um, it can take you, I don't know, three to five years, in my view, with a full you know, brand of the CEO in a relatively, you know, medium-sized bank to get all these elements into place for sure, right? I mean, it takes time and these things, right? The good news is that obviously you don't need all the tools for all organizations, so small fintechs, uh, monoline business units, so that are in a single market, as you know, many of the elements that are there that are not applicable and they're not necessary. Uh, um, so obviously they can take much, much less, right? But uh, yes, uh, the important thing is a buying from the top. I think the chapter 11 that I didn't discuss about the strategy function is important because uh, I claim that we should have a capillarity in the same way that you have it in finance and risk so that you can support the business units. I was able to do that in one of the divisions that I was because I got the, the empowerment. I have 20 people dedicated to do that, but not to the whole organization. I believe that is a case that more than justifies, they obviously can be more than uh, um, paid with a fraction of what you pay to external consultants. And this is something actually that brings me to one of the topics of the Mm, title of the conversation. I think and uh, I believe probably most of the audience would agree that we need to own our strategy organizations. This doesn't preclude us to use strategy consultants or the type of consultants as we may need, but we need to own it. And for that, you need a function that helps you to do that in the same way with the finance that's a superb job in all the numbers, owning the numbers and risks, obviously, and particularly after the Basel III developments post-2008, a great job as well. On, on, on in the, the risk uh, on, in the organization. So we need to, in my view, there's a great opportunity to do that. Um, Clive Bullen's got an interesting question here. Um, so in the UK, economic growth has been weak for many years. Um, do you have any suggestions of what the, about what the UK could be doing better strategically uh, and what's been holding it back? I think the um, short-termism of leaders is definitely a factor there over recent years. Yeah, what it could be doing better strategically and if you have any views in terms of what's holding the UK back. It's very interesting because just last week I was in the McKinsey alumni party and there was a very good uh, uh, gathering and they were sharing an uh, interesting analysis that of the last uh, two or three decades of how compared the UK versus European Union versus the US in terms of the performance of the stock market, the components and the companies into it. And it was quite surprising to see, well, somehow um, that actually the, the, the FTSE 100 has done quite uh, poorly. Right? And part of it is because a, a lot of the companies that compone it are very mature, right? There are not of growth companies like you definitely see in the US, right? Um, but there are as well, there were some um, elements of decision making. Uh, apparently, the, according to the numbers, there was a lot of um, dividend orientation, you know, into the performance of the shares, right? For mostly the, the, the stakeholders, the pension funds, others that they were uh, owning those shares as opposed of investment for growth. So I believe there is a big opportunity for the UK, and I think I smell that uh, right now there is a, a little bit of buzz of getting to that, into both levels, into the level of investing for companies in growth, the startups and medium-sized companies that can grow exponentially, hence the recent uh, mansion house compact that is going to uh, ensure the 5% of assets under management of the pension funds in time goes in that direction, that is critical. And the other element is begin to manage the more mature companies with a, a little bit more orientation for investment and not as much about just appreciating the short-term need of the shareholder in terms of dividend. And, and obviously that comes back to boards and to uh, management, right? So I believe that we pull both. Uh, the UK can do great, right? uh, but uh, we need uh, we need to get our minds to it, right? Mm.
I've got time for one more question. Uh, so Dan Feeney again has um, said, Paolo Cerrone's recent book urges a shift from business outputs to client outcomes. Do you have any thoughts on banks getting better at becoming customer centric? Yes, I mean, it's, um, and as you saw, uh, when we were talking about the business unit, I was absolutely putting a lot of emphasis about the, uh, uh, the very deriving the business model and the strategy blueprint out of the client, right? The client segments, even the KPIs that I'm talking about in finance should be derived from client KPIs. And, and this is the only way, in my view, that you can really begin to go and get banks that, yes, uh, there is a lot of uh, a PR in terms of customer centricity, but the reality of the customer experience don't speak yet to the level that we expect. Obviously, there is differences between banks and banks in that regard, some that are doing better than others. But if you don't regear internally how you do your strategy and your financial and strategy plan uh, around client centricity, uh, uh, then it's impossible to get that down the line. Then as well, you need to take care of the execution and make sure that you help out the people, they help out clients. And obviously you serve clients through the internal uh, teams that one way directly and directly do it. So the execution as well needs to be focused in that direction, but everything starts from the from the thinking. In my experience, in one of the banks that we had precisely in, in the corporate banking, uh, there was an enormous emphasis on, on, on client centricity. Precisely, we derived a lot of those methodologies based on that. It was called the, um, the trusted advisory strategy back then. But that, that bank has been uh, um, awarded uh, the top bank in the UK by the finance directors in the CBI poll for many years in a row. So I guess there is some correlation there about part of the world that was done there and, and, and how this bank is, is receiving recognition. So. Yes, I agree with uh, the audience and, and definitely go in that direction, but it's hard eh? for product oriented banks, particularly in the corporate investment banking world, it's hard. Well, we're out of um, time now. So thank you um, very much again, Ankal, for sharing your time and ideas with us today. I think we've all got a bit of um, homework to do and we've learned a lot, which has been great. And also uh, thanks to our sponsors for making these webinars possible and uh, to you, our audience, for joining and contributing to the discussion today. Uh, don't forget to check out the forthcoming events page on our website. We've got lots of uh, diverse events coming up, including on why the UK needs a written constitution on Tuesday, uh, moving on to crises in the making, which we've certainly been seeing a lot of in the news lately on Wednesday, and then um, a sustainable um, focused, sustainably focused, I should say, webinar on the Thursday. So thank you very much, everyone, and I wish you a good day and rest of the week ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Charlotte.